Hi, I'm Joe Himmeley, and today, by special invitation, we're visiting the City Tavern in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. Come on in. When the City Tavern was built in 1796, it was a very busy place. People would come to pay taxes, mingle, get news, and buy refreshments. At that time, it was known as the 14th Tavern, and today, it's the last remaining original City Tavern in Washington, D.C. In the first half of its life, the City Tavern was used as a tavern, inn, hotel, or bed and breakfast, but it changed hands and names many times. On the street above the entrance, you can still find the sign for the Sign of the Indian King, as it was known from about 1801 until 1805. Some of the other names include Semi's Tavern, United States Hotel, Georgetown Hotel, and Morgan House. By the mid-1900s, the tavern had been converted to retail space and was still being used as such up until it was set to be demolished to make room for a parking lot. The discovery and preservation of this historic building can be credited to Marjorie James and Nancy Gray Pine. They and a group of their preservation-minded friends are commemorated on a plaque at the front door. Mrs. James and Mrs. Pine enlisted their friends to purchase the building for $30,000 in December of 1959 and saved it from demolition. During the award-winning restoration process, it was decided that the building would become a club dedicated to historic preservation. Since the building is over 200 years old, many modifications have been made. So what we see now is not how it was laid out in 1796. They have decided to preserve aspects from different eras of its life. For example, today's entryway and the Great Hall used to be an open space for horse-drawn carriages, but it was enclosed in the 1960s. It was in this room that President Lyndon B. Johnson's daughter had her wedding rehearsal dinner. In fact, one week before the rehearsal dinner, one of the chandeliers fell from the ceiling. As you can imagine, the Secret Service was not very happy to hear that. The Gracie wallpaper in this room is notable. It's original to the 1960s and was hand-painted with a silver wash. Here you can see footprints from when the paper was being laid on the floor before installation on the wall. Now we are in the tap room, which is one of the original rooms from 1796. The floors in here are original, and so is the fireplace. In the corner, you can see a replica of a period-appropriate bar. Much of the artwork in this room depicts the American Revolution, which is appropriate to the time it was built. Today, this room is used as a restaurant for club members. Below the tap room, you'll find the basement. The basement doesn't have any historic details left, as it was converted to office space many years ago. However, it's historically important. The operation of the tavern relied heavily on enslaved labor, and the basement is where some of the enslaved people who worked at the tavern would have slept and worked. Today, the tavern is working with genealogists to uncover more about the people who were enslaved here so their stories can be remembered and retold. Now we're one story above M Street, which historically was called Falls Street. This was likely the original main entrance for the tavern before M Street was lowered in 1815. Adjacent to this space is what was likely a sitting room or receiving room for guests. Some of these guests were important historical figures like John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. John Adams overlooks the mantle in this room. It was found in a different house in Georgetown that was built in the 1790s. Through the tavern's ongoing research, they found that the mantle was original to this building, but had been removed and used in another house in Georgetown before it was returned. On the second level, you'll find one of the club's most popular event spaces. It's called the Bliss Room, named for Ambassador and Mrs. Edward Bliss, who were crucial to the addition of this room to the property. This room was added in the 1970s and sits above the Great Hall. In this cabinet is a very special bust of Benjamin Franklin, and this depiction of him was made by another important American. In 1923, high schooler Warren Berger created this statue of Benjamin Franklin. Berger went on to become the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and held that position from 1969 until 1986. In 1987, the Franklin Mint in Philadelphia gifted Berger with 20 bronze and three silver copies of the bust and encouraged him to pass the gifts along to whomever he saw fit. In 1992, Justice Berger gifted the City Tavern with this one. It's an exact copy of his original work, Cast in Bronze. This room is also where President Ronald Reagan held his inaugural brunch. The patio off the Bliss Room offers a look into the history of the building. Tucked into the gables of the adjoining buildings, you can see where an old window has been bricked over. The gable where the window was is part of the exterior of Mason's Lobsters, which is on a lot originally belonging to the City Tavern. 
Back in 1796, instead of a restaurant serving lobster rolls, this lot was the kitchen, carriage house, and quarters for the enslaved of the city tavern. The building would have been accessed by walking across the courtyard that is now occupied by the Great Hall and the Bliss Room and patio above it. Now let's step into the Yellow Room, also known as the Long Room. This room has remained largely unchanged since 1796 and famously hosted John Adams in 1800. The club is lucky to have accounts of the toasts made to him at a dinner on June 6, 1800. At this dinner, John Adams toasted to Georgetown saying, Georgetown, may its prosperity equal the ardent enterprise of its inhabitants and the felicity of their situation. The City Tavern recreates the event every year in this room where you can find a period appropriate mantle, its original chair railing and art from the 1790s. Just to the side of the yellow room, you'll find a photo with an incredible story behind it. The photo is of Alfred Delaney Clark. Alfred was born into slavery in 1852 and was the third generation of his family to be enslaved by Eleanor Lang. Alfred, his mother, and nine other family members were enslaved at the tavern when it was operating as the Georgetown Hotel between 1834 and 1865. Amazingly, this is the only known photo of anyone who lived at the tavern. This photo is a copy of a much smaller original from a set of cufflinks and a brooch. These accessories belonged to the Clark family and each held a photo of Alfred and a photo of his wife, Virginia. Following DC's Compensated Emancipation Act of 1862, Alfred went on to become a successful businessman in Georgetown and owned several properties. The connection between the City Tavern and the Clark family is accredited to the work of Yvette Lagonnery, who is a descendant of Alfred Clark's and now a director on the board of the City Tavern Preservation Foundation. Up another flight of stairs in the Jefferson Room, you'll find original floorboards and an original mantle from 1796. It's presumed that when Thomas Jefferson would stay here, he'd come to this room to read. Rumor has it that he would drink until enlightenment and then fall asleep here rather than in the bedroom. Adjacent to the Jefferson Room is the Governor's Room. It also has original floors and an original mantle. And in this room, the artwork reflects what was a common pastime in the 1800s, which was cockfighting. Now we're going to go up one more flight of stairs. These are the only original stairs left in the entire tavern, and they're very narrow and very steep. This top floor is where people would have slept when the city tavern was used as an inn during its earlier years. There would not have been individual bedrooms. Instead, there would be multiple people sleeping in the same common room. On this level, you also have original floorboards, but my favorite thing has to be the view from the dormers. You can see so much of the city, including the Washington Monument. For information about how you can visit the amazing City Tavern, check out their website, www.citytaverndc.org. I hope you enjoyed the video, so please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you won't miss our next great video of a historic property. Thank you.